Hello, this is Father Gary, Armed with Faith, back again for another great episode with a good friend, uh, Robert Krantz, who is a Greek-American. It's uh, short for Karunzos, and uh, he's been in quite a few movies. You'll recognize him if you're a fan of Elinas Multimedia, and if you're not a fan, you should go subscribe to it, see what they've got there at elinasmultimedia.com. Uh, Bob Krantz is uh, shooting all kinds of movies these days. He lives here in Southern California with his wife, Trisha. They have triplet sons, Chris, George, and Nick, and um, he's done quite a few um, independent films. Do You Want to Dance, Christmases, Christmas with the Karunzeses, Faith, Hope, and Love, which he received nominations for Best Screenplay, Best Picture, Best Actor, and he actually won Best Director. Congratulations, Bob, at the International Christian Film Festival. So we're, um, you've got a lot of stuff, even books on, on there, Bob. How are you today? I'm doing great. Actually, the last one we, and you were on the set. He, we actually had Father on the set. Uh, the one we just finished a week ago called A Marriage Made in Heaven. That, that looked like a lot of fun. And the, and the premise to that was great. We're going we're gonna to get around to that. But Bob, you do, you've done all kinds of stuff. You've, you were, I want to go back in time a little bit and pardon the pun because uh, you were in Back to the Future. But go back a little bit and um, talk about how we know each other. Your, your brother, Tim, was my Sunday school teacher growing up. And I tell a, a funny story about Tim and how uh, my brother and I used to, instead of taking our dollars and going into the church um, and putting our dollars in the tray, we used to sneak across the street to Yaya's kitchen and uh, put our money together and get an orange soda and split a diropita. And, uh, <laughs> and your, your, uh, your brother, Tim, taught me the greatest lesson of youth ministry, and that was meet the kids where they're at. And uh, he actually came across the street, found us there, and uh, did some Sunday school lessons right there. Oh, that's yeah, kitchen great. on Pico and Normandy, which was great. It was awesome. That's great, great. That's you great. were the guy. You were the guy in the Miata. You were the cool. You were the cool actor ah. in the Miata that drove in and out, always coming to church, always very faithful. Um, when I was a kid, you know that I wanted to be in the in the industry, but uh, God had other plans for me. But uh, you've always been very gracious with what you've done, and I want to say that you never got bit by the Hollywood bug. You've always been very kind of faithful, very devout. And um, these are some of the things that I want to talk about, but you not only do film, you've done, we've done videos together, you've done videos for the church, you've done saints videos, you've done books as well. So tell me where that passion, where that faithfulness, where that love, your brother even uh, uh, went to seminary with me for a year or two, and um, your, your sister's very faithful, you're all very faithful people. So where does that come from? You know, the short answer is from God and how, I, you know, I was talking to my wife about it over the weekend. Um, you know, my parents didn't force religion on us. Um, they talked about it. And there was a period there where we were, I forget what you call it, the Eastern Christmas um, churchgoers. And I'll tell you something very interesting. There was a priest named Father Angela, who was the main priest at Assumption in, in, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where I grew up. And I remember being old enough to realize that we didn't come around that much. And not only did we not come around much, when we did come around for Easter, Christmas, we would be late. So we'd be sitting way up top. And, and I do remember once, because you could see through the icons how crowded it was. And I remember once we, we were looking at it, it was like Christmas Eve service. And we're like, oh, dad, dad, it's full, it's full. Uh, you know, let's go home. And I remember my dad said one thing. He said, okay, he goes, but don't ask me to go next year. We're like, no, 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 no. Let us out of the car because my dad didn't say much. But when he did, and I remember coming down the stairway, rounding the corner, and the priest was maybe five yards away. And he turned, and I was thinking, oh, what is this going to be like? And he greeted us like his night was complete because we were there. He was so welcoming and hugged us and was so happy to see us. And I often wonder what would have been like if he had treated us otherwise. Wow, that's such a great story. Wow, it's so true, right? Like that moment in history, that moment in your life, right? And, and I ended up going to a Bible study uh, with Father Angelo and then I went, when I was 17, my senior year in high school, I went to the Orthodox camp. 
And that had a profound effect on me. So it was a gradual thing, but I think, you know, it was steps. It was that, it was going to the Orthodox camp. It was going to Bible study, but I have felt a longing to be close to Christ from day one. And I, I, my, my great grandfather was a priest. I don't know if it, I don't know where it came from, but I knew very early on, I was saying to my wife over the weekend, when I was playing basketball in high school, our team was doing really well and winning all these things, going to state and so forth. And I remember even during those games thinking, I can't wait to get home and pray. And, and the other day I thought of you when I was telling my wife this, um, when we finished the last film, we finished Saturday. I didn't get to sleep till I think two in the morning. But the first thing I did was I went to church and you were there. You were the, the priest presiding over it with Father Bill. And that's the first thing I, I look forward to that more than anything else is getting back to church and just praying and being with God. Um, and where that comes from, I just think that God reaches out to each person. I think God wants that relationship with each person. But for whatever reason, I have heard that, that, like Christ says, draw unto me and I will draw unto you. And I have felt that since I was, since I can remember that I felt he was looking for me, searching for me and wanting to be close to me. And I've done my best. You know, there's even now I feel like, oh, I'm saying to my wife of the weekend, I want to get more into Bible study. I want to be more proactive it's it's too much of this other stuff and, it, and i don't like that so it's a it's a process but it, it it's been in my whole life but but you've spent your whole life merging your two loves for for media and and uh, the church and doing a great job of representing both right like you you're not doing like hokey stuff and just putting stuff out there and it's not it's not low quality you're doing some high grade stuff which like uh, Faith, Hope, and Love, for example, is on Netflix, right? If somebody wanted to go right now and watch, it was, it was there for two years. It just went off in February, but okay. it's it's available a million other places. Yeah, places. And then and then your books, Sophia, and then um, you've got the the uh, Saints things that we did when I was at the seminary. Those were those were fantastic as well. The Saints series, so people can see these things. You've really merged it together, and that love that you have for Christ really kind of, like I said, for a young man like me that was looking up to the guys that were older than me, just a few years older, but it was always very impressionable to see that there were people that were going to USC film school that were coming to church, right? Um, there were, we, we were, we're talking about the cathedral in Los Angeles here, which is just a few blocks from USC. And so it's, it's all a matter of, of uh, doing that. When you did, do you want to, wait, I want to go back to something real quick because um, the kids call me FG at the summer camps and the, and the things. And they got that from your movie, uh, Do You Want to Dance, from right. the priest being called FC, right? Right. And so I want to go back to the YAL conference where you met Father Chris Kerhoulis. Yeah. And you went and, and as part of the YAL conference, you guys went to a homeless shelter. And oh, is this part of that YAL in St. Louis? Part of that YAL in St. Louis. And you came across somebody that you recognized. Do you remember this story? Am I, am I bringing any bells? Uh -uh. You, you, didn't you run into somebody that you knew that from high school and that had you not been at that y'all conference, you would have not seen a friend of yours with Father Chris, or maybe it was somebody who you were with from that part? Well, I'll tell you what I remember. I thought this is what you were going to say. The day I met him, we were going to a Blackhawks game. Okay. <laughs> and there, he had a Bible study that he had sent out a flyer for. And, um, I was with his son, Peter. So I remember thinking, oh man, I hope this Bible is because he said, look, I sent out a bunch of flyers. I don't think anyone's going to show up. I think we're good. So we go to the church and no one's there. And we're like, ah, cool, cool. All right, we can go, you know, we can go to the Blackhawks game. So we start to leave. And just then one person, a lady walks by. And I'm thinking all he's going to say is like, oh, it got canceled, blah, blah, blah. Because we're out the door. We're in the parking lot. And he didn't do that. He went inside and sat with her for at least a half hour, if not 45 minutes. And I remember, I didn't know him that well then. And I remember thinking, this guy's going to be a friend for life because that was the one sheep that was, had gone astray or whatever. I don't even know what happened. But I, the fact that he, he did not just 
blow her off and go with us. It left such an impression on me that he sat and spent time with that one person. <laughs> and we went to the Blackhawks game and he was totally, you know, he was, he was a nut job. But, and that was, that was the, kind of the cool thing too, is he was, and they, the Blackhawks were losing, he got up and walked out of the arena. I'm like, dude, I don't even know where I'm at. What are you doing? But I love that he was, uh, he was just that. And so I told him at the end of that weekend, I was in my mid twenties then. I remember saying, I'm going to make a movie about this someday. And he said, about what? And I said, just about the difference that one person can make when they take time and address somebody's life. Uh, and I want to tell you one quick thing, because you mentioned St. Sophia's Cathedral. Yeah. When I was, I think I was 21 years old, uh, I went into that cathedral alone by myself, and I sat there, and I said, God, I think this is what you want me to do with my life. It doesn't make any sense to me because I came from Milwaukee. My parents were, you know, typical Greek parents with restaurant and all that stuff. And uh, mama's still mom, no theater back, none of that stuff. It made no sense to me what I was at film school and studying acting. But I said, I think this is what you want me to do with my life. If I'm wrong, stop me from the moment I leave here. Um, but if this is what you want me to do, essentially the parable of the talents, right. um, then let me, then let it be. And you know, when Jesus talked about, it was about Paul and somebody, I can't remember the reference, but he said, they were talking about Paul and he said, Paul will be shaken. Paul will, it, he's going to pay the price for what he's been called right. to do. Right. When he said to, about Peter, when the devil approached him about, he said, I'll pray for you, Peter. It's always left a mark on me that being called to do God's work is one thing, but there's a price you pay for it. Yep. And from that moment when I went to the church and prayed that, that God is, this is what I think you want me to do, I can imagine that God said it is, but there's a price you're going to pay for it. I paid for it over the next 20, 30 years. I paid for it in many ways, but it was continuously that I felt like this is what God called me to do, to merge faith and media, and I try to do it to the best that I can do it. Yeah, like I said, you've you've not compromised in any way, in any way, shape, or form. I remember being a kid and uh, watching you in Back to the Future. You were the guy. You had a great little role, you know, where somebody watches it and go back and see when when Marty McFly punches Biff, right? right. Uh, it cut to you, and your your line is, "That's George McFly." George McFly. That was great. <laughs> but you, but Bob, but seriously, I know I tell you this all the time, and I'm, you're probably sick of me hearing it, but your movies have like. A message that you that you want to spread, right? Like, let's go back to the very first one. Do you want to dance? And and that's where you you featured your relationship with Father Chris, right? And you even right. call the priest in the movie Father Chris. Yeah. And um, where where did the inspiration for that movie come from? And uh, no matter what any film professor tells me, I you know I studied film. Every movie has some sort of biographical something in it, right? Like, there's something from our lives that touches us and makes us want to write that movie or make that movie. So somehow, some way, you were inspired somewhere along the way to do. Do you want to dance? Where does where does that where did that come from? You know, it, first of all, I, at that point, I had written a bunch of screenplays and sold them to the studios, and they went in a turnaround, which means they were just languishing there. What happens is you sell it. There's a president. That president then gets removed at, along the way, and the new president comes in and doesn't want to give the old president credit for anything, so he just dumps everything. And I remember thinking, I'm not. This is not adding up to what I want my life to be. And so I, um, I wanted to make a movie of substance. And it was around that time that Father Chris had affected my life. And I wanted to show what the effect in this particular case, a priest can have by just touching one person's life. And so, but I also wanted to do this, and this was critical for me. Too many of the faith-based, and by the way, there was not, no such thing then called faith-based. It was, I remember telling my mom, and she told me years later, God rest her soul, I told her, I said, I'm going to make these films with a faith element to it. And she just thought, where are you going to go with, like, what, who's going to be watching that? Right. But what I did was I took, I took dance, I took faith, and I took family, romance, marriage, whatever you want to call it. And I merged those three elements. And what I was dedicated to from then until this day is if you took the time to get a babysitter so somebody could watch your kids. If you took the time that you were uh, uh, 
going to lead the office early to go watch one of my movies. If you took the time, I was going to make sure that I entertained you every frame possible so that you, it wasn't a stuffy religious experience. And I remember uh, early on, a, a well-known actor, a friend of mine said to me, I said, I sent him, do you want to dance? And he, I said, what do you think? He goes, he, and he wasn't religious. He said, you know, if you believe in God, everything works out. I go, is that what you got? He goes, yeah. And I looked at it and the word God was throughout the whole film. And I thought, okay, I don't want to pound people over the head. So one of the things I've consciously done when I go through these films, I do my best to pull it back so that I can reach the non-believer, the semi-believer, and the believer, um, and not, if you come to that film and you're not a believer, I still want to leave you with a good enough impression that you don't feel like I was pounding over the head. A lot of the faith-based films today pound you over the head. Everything's perfect in their life. Everything's great in their life. You right. go, well, my goodness. Now what I try to do is I try to show, and that was the other thing. I, for better or for worse, when I came into this world, I, my, my mom would be at the, we'd be at the dinner table and she'd say, so-and-so got in a car accident today and I'd be eating dinner. Well, that would be the end of dinner for me. I, I, I'd be crushed. And then my mom would all see this and she goes, but they walked away and they're fine. In fact, they're home tonight celebrating Christmas, Bobby. Don't worry about it. You know, I was like, okay, you can start eating again. And so what's happened throughout my life, similar to what I'm guessing a priest is like, I just hear a lot of what's going on in people's lives and the suffering and the troubles and the heartaches and it affects me greatly i, I wish it didn't uh it really just man just the smallest of things that i hear people going through it's just it's painful for me and the only way i could get that through my system was by writing and by writing about people that are going through divorce, my family went through divorce and my sister went through divorce and to write about divorce and to write about um, pursuing your dreams and to write about loss and to write about heaven and to write about all those things. It was a way of me, um, cathartic experience. And what I found was when I wrote those movies, Do You Want to Dance and those experiences, um, it resonated with people because it was those words and those images and those scenes affected them. I remember the very first time we screened, Do You Want to Dance? We was in front of a thousand people at the Field Museum in Chicago. One of the greatest experiences of my life. I remember it got to this critical moment at the end when, when Father Chris, the character, passes away. And I remember people were, started coughing and blowing their nose and stuff. I'm thinking, oh, you're ruining this moment. Like, like couldn't you have done that five minutes? It never dawning on me, they were crying. Yeah, that's great. That's great. That's it never great. dawned on me. You ruined didn't... my moment. <laughs> yeah, no, I realized because I started hearing it every screening, and I was like, I just never thought that what I would do would have that much of an effect. Yeah. So now I realize I can't even begin to tell you that the uh, every day it happens that I get an email or a letter or a text or something saying, you know, I lost a loved one, I just got divorced, whatever, and I've been watching your film over and over again, and and then it's just I just. You know, I've got an icon right above my computer. It's the best place for an icon of Christ. It is, it is. And, um, and um, I just immediately take that praise and give it to him and say, thank you, thank you. Good, good for you, good for you. So, you know, the, some of the, the things that we do here on Armed with Faith is try to give people ideas of how to work with youth and how to do things. You've got um, some, you've got a guide, guide to Holy Week that you've written, and you've got also the uh, guide to the Divine Liturgy. Um, how how can those be used in youth ministry, especially now when we're trying to get our kids back into the church after the pandemic, right? Um, I was thrilled that you mentioned that Sunday that we were together down at St. Basil's in San Juan Capistrano. I saw you earlier that week and you were like, and I, and I know it's like being late on a set. And you said, I don't know if we're going to be there, Father. We're finishing late Saturday night, early Sunday morning. And when you walked in, I was thrilled to see you there because it shows a great commitment. But we're trying to get our people back into the pews, right? How do you think that your, your uh, guide to divine liturgy would, would help a Sunday school teacher, help a priest, help a youth worker, inspire young people and their parents to get back into the pews? All right. So, by the way, great sermon. Great Thank sermon. You. Thank you. That, and, I, and I'm going to tie that in. Two different things I'm going to throw at you here. Number one, to all any priest that's watching, I'm telling you right now, if you are looking how to grow your parish, how to sustain your parish, etc. Work on that sermon. 
it is the number one area where we are getting our you know what kicked by other other faiths. We are getting destroyed by it. Um, not to even mention that the majority of the time in the Orthodox Church, we put up millions of dollars into the church, into the icons, into the marble, into the everything. And then we go to Radio Shack and get a little speaker. <laughs> right. you, can't, you can't even hear it. And you go like, what? I can't even hear it. And then they're speaking yeah. Greek. And then they go, but come back next Sunday. That's got to change. If you want to, if you want, and here's the point. I can remember, keep your fork. That was your sermon. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you any other sermon in the last year I've heard. Wow. That's, that's really humbling. Thank you. So I'm telling you, that's number one. If you're a priest and you're hearing this, get that sermon. And, and I'm, it's the, no different than when I'm, I'm about to start editing our new film. I will spend three to four months, eight to 10 hours a day going over every frame because that audience has a limited attention. And you've got to, the moment they're there, you've got to get them in there. So that's my, that's my first thought. In terms of what the second thing is, the book, uh, Guide to the Divine Liturgy. Here is the truth, whether we want to admit it or not. I'm going to guess that 75 to, I'm going to even go up to 90% of the people in the, in the pews don't know what's going on during the divine liturgy. Okay. And we are on a limited time before that group starts saying, you know, down the street is Mariners and down the street is blah, blah, blah. And down the street, and they're in English. And, and I just, I'm, I, I got to go there because I, I don't really know what's going on in, in the Orthodox Church. And it's the honest to God truth. The reason I wrote that book, I had three kids that were two, three years old when I wrote it, four years, I can't remember. And I thought, I can't blow this. I can't blow this. First of all, it was a miracle that God gave me those, uh, my wife and I, those three boys. It was a miracle. They almost died when she was pregnant. Wow. And, um, and I thought, okay, I've got to, if I can't give away something I don't know. I've got to start to understand what's going on in this divine liturgy. As I said in the book, it was like a beautiful foreign film to me. I understood oh, that's kind of what's happening. Ah, here's the peak of the service, the beauty of the music was good, but there's no subtitles. I didn't know what was going on. Right. I didn't understand what was going on. When they shook the cloth over there, I don't know. I don't, boo, you know, I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know what the the small inch, the big inch, nothing, 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 nothing. That's only going to last for so many generations. My yaya but went, okay, I'll go. But eventually we're going to lose. And so this book, it was meant so that a priest or a, a Sunday school teacher can walk through and say, by the time they get out of Sunday school, you know what's going on in the divine liturgy. That is critical. And that is because that's the centerpiece of our faith. That's every Sunday. If you go in there and you know what's going on in the divine liturgy and that priest delivers a great sermon, now you've got an interest for somebody coming back. But without those two, what do you have? If I don't know what's going on, if I can't hear you and it's a bad sermon, what is going to bring them back, Father Gary? Right. Who's going right. to bring them back? Why? We're on borrowed time at that point. That's just a matter of until I go to college and mom and dad aren't there, probably not going to go anymore. So it's interesting that you say that because, you know, uh, there's a statistic that flies around and, and uh, we were just told uh, earlier this week that uh, it's, it's different than it's, it's increased. Uh, it's now 65%, six and a half kids out of 10 leave uh, high school, go to college and never return to the Orthodox church. They leave our Sunday schools. They, and I'm not saying they come back when they get married. They never come back. Six and a half out of ten, right? I'm telling you the reason why. Is, yeah, is I know. So why you're right. I you've got it. You've got it. You've got it right there. But we have passionate people that work with our youth, right? That want them to come back. We've got people like you that are creating books and movies and, and things like that to do it. Um, I, I think that the church is starting to listen and starting to get it because um, you know our metropolitan here on the west coast, Metropolitan Yad Ashmos, has instituted a sermon, um, a, a sermon. Uh, workshop for clergy for the, over the next three weeks. So uh, we're spending our Friday afternoons studying with uh, people like Hank Hanegraaff. I don't know if you know the Bible Answer Man, but he's on there uh, uh, giving us sermon tips and, and classes. So you're right. They've heard you. The, 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 some, some of the Metropolitans and the bishops have heard you. Well, I volunteer my time. 
I've actually told them I'll go to New York and teach a class, a seminar on it. I'll, I'll bring that up and let's hope that somebody sees this. I will fly out on my own dime. I will do it for free because I'm telling you, this is this is why the Joel Osteens who just do a sermon are destroying. They are, they are, and that because then people people want that message, but that message is shallow ended, right? Like we have the theology and we have the mysticism and we have all that, and if we fullness don't, have the, yeah, the fullness of the faith. You and I have talked about that. Yeah. We have the fullness yeah. of the faith. Yeah. Bupkis, what does it do? Right, right. And unless unless you know how to employ it, it just sits there collecting dust, right? And so that's the thing that we need to teach our peoples is how to how to get it into their hearts and into their actions on a, on a daily basis. And when somebody gets it, like you know, in youth ministry, especially when a kid gets it and that aha goes off, you can see how it changes their lives. And I, and I just try to get that. You, you've done that with, uh, with faith, hope, and love. I saw it happen to my daughter. Uh, you met Elena a couple weeks ago when we were on the set. She is still talking about it. Um, uh, she came home wanting to be a makeup artist. Then the next day, wanted to be a script supervisor. And then she was like, what did that lady do that was sitting in the chair? I was like, she was the line producer. I want to do what she was doing. And I said, you've got the bug. You're, it's going to eat you up now. But um, when we watched Faith, Hope, and Love a few years ago, she got it. She, she knew that what was missing in that relationship in that movie was, was faith, was, like, was, was hope, was, was love, right? And in that story, where did that story come from? How did it develop? Um, what were some of the changes that you made in it? And I have to say that um, when you're doing these things, you're not putting hokey pokey you know, people in these roles. You've got some quality actors, quality story, quality material, quality... Um, uh, production, but when you're putting the story faith, hope, and love together, what what is it that you want? Let's say a, an Orthodox kid. Let's go with that, okay? As your audience, what do you want an Orthodox kid to leave understanding about the characters in the story? You know, first of all, where that came from was I was going to make Falling in Love with Sophia, the book I wrote. I was going to make it into a movie, and I went to gym. And this has happened now twice. Went to the gym and finished working out. And I went and sat on a bench and there was a dance class going on behind me. And I remember looking by the time I'd sat at that bench, like God had put it on my heart. And I, we were going to Mexico the next day. And I was riding on the plane. My son said, what are you doing? I said, I, I think I came up with this great idea. And I actually kept that piece of paper that I wrote the idea down on. Um, part of it is when, how long have you been married now? 25 years this summer. Right. When you say I'm 29 this summer. Yeah. Okay. Once you marry that long to somebody, by the way they breathe, you know whether they're mad, happy. <laughs> you know, you know, they don't have to tell you I'm mad at you anymore. It's like, okay, what? What do I do? But you know, mad, happy, sad, it, it, like that. Same thing is with your relationship with Christ. When you spend years cultivating that friendship and that love, you know it doesn't take a whole lot. And I knew that moment when they went into my brain, I started writing, I knew, I knew pretty sure this is what God wants me to do. So you develop that relationship. That's the first step. What I want people to get out of it, I was asked that in a, a live interview once, and I remember pausing for what felt like an hour, but it was probably 20 seconds, but it was a live interview. And I remember thinking, Bob, just say anything. But I thought, no, I'm not going to give a fluff answer. And ultimately, the answer came back, hope. They said, what do you want people to get out of this movie? and hope, and that was critical to me. What I want people, an Orthodox person or any person to understand is there's options in life. You can, you know, my wife and I were talking about this over the weekend. There's so many people that, that um, actually, let me change that. It was Elizabeth Rome, the female actress who plays the lead, who's also a believer. Um, we were talking about it one day, and we were talking about our lives in the industry, and I was talking, about people I grew up with that were multi-millionaires that had careers that there's no way you could ruin this career. I mean, this career was, these people were making tens of millions of dollars a movie, but they, they, it got ruined. And she was saying the same thing people she knew. And we sat there and I said, how do you think it is that you and I are continuing to make films? And these people who had, were, I mean, huge success. And she said at the end, she goes, I think it comes down to a spiritual element. And I, I kind of agree with that. I think that that what I'm hoping people get out of a film like Faith, Hope, and Love is hope, number one. Uh, but I also want people to understand if you have that, that spiritual element in your life, if you have God in your life, what you then have is the great field general who's way above where you are marching on the ground and saying, go left, go right, go up, go down. 
And if you're connected to him, it'll, he'll take you in directions that don't feel good at times, that feel uncomfortable, that feel, wait, this can't be right. But I have found the vast majority of my life without fail. Ultimately, when I get there, I go, oh my God, this, this is why God led me this way. I'll give you an example. That film, Do You Want to Dance? We screened it for a thousand people and it was a standing ovation. And we knew we had a, a huge hit on our hands. We went the next day to California to screen it for all the studios. So we knew like, oh man, this man, like we're going to, we got you. 20 minutes of that film, the sound started going out. I had no idea what was happening. And I ran up to the booth and the guy told me in absolute panic that the light bulb that went through the film oh, was no. burning out and that they didn't have a replacement. And he said, can you, can you invite them back tomorrow? I go, to the heads of the studio. I'm like, I got them here tonight. It was one of the worst moments of my life. It took me five years after that moment to understand what God had done. But I'm telling you, it was a gruesome five years. It was like, or people were telling me at the time, okay, you made your movie, move on, do something else. That, that didn't work out. And it was just hanging on by a thread. In fact, at one point, I remember going in and praying. Everyone had passed. Every studio had passed. And I remember going in and praying. And there was one st uh, studio left, Largo. And I said, God, if they pass, I'm going to move on and do something else with my life. But do you remember that day at St. Sophia when you told me, I thought we had an agreement. I said, but I'll follow your will. I said, but you're going to have an angry son on your hand. I hate saying that part, but I got to be honest. I feel horrible saying that, but I think we've all had that conversation with God. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I've been there. I've been there. So I hear you. Sorry, I, God, I feel don't bad. feel bad. Don't feel bad. So, um, but uh, about a half hour later, they called up Largo and said, uh, they asked who our lawyer was. And I remember Mike Burma, the co-producer said, uh, don't look up, don't look down. I think they bought our film for foreign rights. And that was God. When God answered me, I never looked back after I went through a lot of tough times after that. That's one thing I also want to say. Sometimes you read a resume and you say he's done this, that, and what, everything else. And it, it circumvents the sacrifice, the incredibly low times, the, uh, you know, for 15 years when we had our children, I just, I developed Elena's Multimedia. Once God gave me the three boys, I was re ready to quit altogether because it was a miracle they were born. And the last thing I was going to do was screw up being a father. That there was, I was willing to forego everything. And I didn't act for, or produce a film for 15 years until they were sophomores in high school. And that's when I made the Christmas with the Karunas. I didn't know if I had a career. I didn't know if anybody cared about me at that point. Um, and I remember I finished the film, came home, and there was a note from my son, George, on the doorstep. And it said, are you done yet? Went upstairs and I told my wife, I said, I'm not going to make another film until they're in college. And that's when they went to college that fall is when I uh, started making uh, Faith, Hope, and Love. Um, and that each one of these films takes about, at least for me, four years of preparation and thought. And is this really what I want to say? Because what's going to happen is starting now, we're going to send out a notice to all the churches and all the priests and everything. We have premier screenings for fundraisers at all these churches. And I have to know in my bones, when I go to a church with this film, that there's something that of value to that parish not just me up there dancing and monking around. And so I give that tremendous thought. And um, that's what I hope when, when we're gonna do this fall, when we start screening the new film, that, uh, that it has that impact. So let's talk about the new film. Uh, the new film uh, uh, had somebody who I worked with on it, which was great to see him. It was uh, uh, Tom Arnold was, was there on the set that night as well. What really, you know, people can say what they want about, about Tom, but he was really genuinely great to me he I, we, I reminded him that we worked together on a film and he goes oh I remember you and I said no you don't he said yeah you're right I don't he was trying to be kind it was great um but uh but let's talk about that movie what's the premise what's the idea what what are we looking forward to here because we have do you want to dance we have faith hope and love and now this new one is called a marriage made in heaven marriage made in heaven I love it and um and let's go let's go with the premise and and what you're hoping uh people will see when they watch this movie so the premise is, is one of my favorite of all time because it's, it really is one of those thought-provoking premises. It asks the question, if you were able to relive one week of your life, which week would you relive? Wow. And it's interesting. I thought I had my answer right away, and I started thinking, oh, wait, wait. 
uh, my parents were divorced. And wait, let me go back a little further. Well, Yai and Papu weren't alive. That's, I kept going like, where, what's the week that I, like life was like so great. Or some people have said, I'd go back to this week and change something I did wrong and mm. change my life. So that's the basic premise. The uh, one line is sometimes life gives you a second chance at a first love. And then the uh, basic uh, synopsis is I play a guy named uh, Dimitri Chikopoulos, who is a uh, talk show host, Daytime with Dimitri. And on the outside, for the first five minutes of the movie, it all looks phenomenal. It's a great show, great everything. And just, you just like say, oh my gosh, does this look like fun? But I go, uh, shortly thereafter, I go to uh, visit my mom's tombstone at the gravesite. And you see that my... Um, not only has my mom passed away, but my uh, younger brother, Yanni, died at a young age. And I'm sitting there, I put flowers down, I kind of lean back, and it's just kind of a very quiet moment. You realize, wow, there's, there's more going on with this guy than you realize. And you, and you also know that I'm divorced at that point. So I'm divorced, I've lost my mom. My younger brother died when I was uh, younger. And I lean back, and there's Tom Arnold. And he says, hey, and he said, can I help? And I said, can I help you? And he said, no, I'm here to help you. And I said, no, I think you're in the wrong area. This is just my, my family plot. So but he goes, yeah, I know Yanni, your mom, your dad. And I said, do I know you? He goes, no, I know you. And I said, who are you? And he goes, I'm your guardian angel. So awesome. Tom, Tom plays my guardian angel. I kept saying to the cast director, who do you want? I said, a guy that when the trailer comes on and he says, I'm your guardian angel, you go like, oh my God. <laughs> who, would, who would want that guy right. for your guardian angel? And so it was Tom. Uh, Tom's in it. Uh, he plays the guardian angel. And then um, he's the one at early on in the film. He said, the God allows me to go back for one week in my life. And I go back for one week. And Tom is, he's back there with me for that week. <laughs> and she's doing all this stuff. He's like, he's just a very funny guy. Um, and so it's, it's Tom. It's also uh, Vivica Fox is in it. Um, I'm going to leave somebody out. Kim Coles is in it. She's great. Elizabeth Rome is in it. She plays uh, my wife. She was on Law and Order. Paul Rodriguez is in it, who's fantastic. Oh, really? He's so good. He's so wonderful. He plays a therapist in it. And Connie Selica, who I'd worked with years ago on Hotel, is in it, and she's great. So it's all of these people. Oh, and what a great cast, Bob. I didn't, I didn't know that you had all those people on there. That's great. Like yeah. I said, you had Ed Asner and Michael Richards on the last one this, and, and others yeah. as well. I was going to mention you about Michael Richards. Michael Richards had gone through a publicity kind of downfall. I was going to mention that. I was, I was careful not to mention that, but you picked him up right as that publicity downfall hit and you, you, put it, you, you gave him a chance. That's exactly what happened. Um, you know, I talked to my sister, who's not even in the industry, <laughs> I'm like, hey, what do you think about this? And she said, Bob, people are, just, people are forgiving. They'll move on. And I thought about it. And he was one of the nicest people I've ever worked with. Yeah. Um, just, and I consider him a friend that I could call up and say, hey, Mike, would you do this? He just was a really good guy. And it was one of those things I remember thinking at, at the end. You know, if you're making these films about forgiveness and love, so you've got to kind of imbue it when you're making them with the choices you make and, and Michael was wonderful to work with. And I'm glad we did that. Um, and it, and it worked out great. He was wonderful, but all these people are people that it's interesting. Um, each one of them, at this one in particular, a lot of people were of, uh, people that were of faith. Uh, some of the other ones, they weren't, people weren't of faith, but they still did the film But this one. There was quite a few people that were believers that were involved in it. It was pretty cool. A great feeling. Wow. That's, that's Connie, awesome. Connie's really religious. Paul was religious. Elizabeth was religious. And, and Tom, who's Jewish, said he also said he's an ordained minister. So <laughs> I don't know how that all flushes out, but he, he says, uh, he, he, I showed up, I showed up on your set with my collar on and he said in costume or for real. And I said, for real. He said, <laughs> said right. It was great. It was great. Um, Bob, a, a, a lot of times in life, you know, we, we have to make decisions where um, you, it's interesting, the premise of your, of your movie, the first thing that I thought of was instead of going back and living a week of my life where it was great, which I never, which was the secondary thought, the first thing I thought of was what would I go back and change, right? So a lot of times in life, we have to decide, there's got to be a moment in our lives where we decide, like, am I going to go down this road or am I going to go down that road? And I specifically remember, and you were part of this conversation with me 30 years ago, 
I remember sitting there thinking, do I want to continue down the film path or do I need to go where I feel God is calling me to? And looking back on it, I can tell you that I honestly know that God chose me to do what I'm doing and what I'm doing is what I'm supposed to be doing. And I'm, and I, and I think that I'm, I'm pretty good at it. I make a lot of mistakes. Yeah. But I don't think that I, you know, I don't think I'm the best, but I, I think that I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not bad, but in, in life, when you chose this premise for the guardian angel, what are some of the things that you think are defining moments for young people in their lives and that they should be looking out for, right? Because you, you, as a father, you mentioned two defining moments for yourself, or three, actually. The first one, your kid, your wife being pregnant and almost losing the children, right? The second one, um, them being in high school and your son was saying, are you done yet? Can you, you know, do you have time for us? And then the third one, they leave and go to school. And um my boys are gone at school as well, right? And I've still got my daughters 13, but time goes by like that. Yeah. What are some defining moments in people's lives that you think need to be really kind of crafted carefully? I'll tell you, I can get boil it down to one. Uh, my, By the way, my kids graduated college, came home during COVID, were here, and then they are just now leaving, if you can believe this, for New York. So George already left, uh, Nick's about to leave, and I think Chris, who's... I got an interview right now. I <laughs> pray to God that goes good. He's going to probably join them. And this is when they were graduating from college. Well, real quick, I, I want to pause. If somebody tuned in late, I want to make sure that they know these are triplets. These are yeah. three boys. They're not identical, right? You can, you, right. if you're looking at them, but they're triplets. They're all born the same moment, right? Okay. Yeah, they were, and they weren't there. We almost, at one point, they wanted us to abort two of them, one or two oh. of them. And it was, uh, it was, I can't even, you know, there are moments in your life when you pray to God and you keep doing your work and keep hustling. And there are moments where no matter what you do, no matter how much of a type A personality, there's nothing you can do. And when my wife, when she went into, she went into labor at 12 weeks and there was nothing we could do. I couldn't work longer hours. I couldn't uh, uh, pay more money to somebody. I, it was, came down to God. And I'm telling you, <laughs> when God gave me those three boys, uh, that's why I stopped everything, because I knew what he had given me. And that's why I dedicated every ounce of energy to raising those kids. I'll tell you what took the longest and hardest and consistent effort is to make sure that drugs didn't get anywhere near those kids. And if they did, that my kids had all the ammunition to stay away from it. What do I mean? I knew that there was drinking going on. I knew that there was drugs all over the place. I knew that for sure. But when the kids called me once, I think they were like 12 years old and it was during my busy season, Christmas, I was up all night working and they're like, hey, we want to go walk around the infield of the football game at the high school. It was raining out. It was drizzling out. I was sick. I think I had kidney stones at the time. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. I can't do this. I said, all right, be out front in 15 minutes, pull up in the car. They jump in the back and I drive about a half a block. I stop the car. I turn around and said, Hey, listen, when you get to be older, someone's going to ask you to do drugs. And when you're walking around that infield tonight, you look in the stands and you see dad, cold, raining, et cetera. I want you to remember that image of me sitting up there. And that's when I'm going to take that IOU out of the bank and say, don't do drugs. That's, that's what you guys owe me for this. And I don't know if that's what kept them off it, but I'm telling you, the devil is out there. And what do I mean by that? In their fraternity, kids literally came within inches of dying from drug overdose and so forth. They were, it was around them. And I just think, I remember that particular night because the boys, when they were going to sleep, said to each other, thank God we never got involved with drugs. So that was the, that's the first thing I'm saying is that it takes an all out effort mm -hmm. a movie you make for four years, you edit it. It's there. It's done. A parent from day one, you are a parent until you check out. It's a nonstop thing, but here's, here's my advice to a parent. How do I can refine it? When the boys were graduating college, I thought, okay, I want to leave them with some guidance and thought. And it was this. I said, when you get to be 60, 65, 70, if you were to write yourself a note now at 21, 22, and you open that note up at 65, 70, this is the question I would ask. Define success in your life. 
define for me at 21 what you're going to say at 65 and open up and go, this is what I thought success would be. Did you achieve it? That is critical because I would then take my boys and say, and I've done this in, in the y'alls uh, when I go and speak at the y'alls. I say, tell me what industry you're in entertainment. I'm in science. I'm in agriculture. I'm in law. Who's the, who's the number two, three, four people there? They'd write all the names down. There are successes. They'd write them all down. And I'd say, okay, that's it. Now I'd come over. Tell me what, what's going to be a success for you when you're 65. And it was, um, I'd like to be married. I'd like to have children. Um, I said, are you okay with a starter marriage? One where you just kind of get it. And then by the second or third one, no, 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 no. I want, I want to be married for, okay. Are you okay? Kids do drugs, some cocaine. Are you okay? No, 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 no. I don't want any of that in my life. Okay, you don't want that. Um, you want a house or do you want to just kind of float? Or, no, no, I, I want a house. I want a steady job. I got all that. Okay. I'd go through each one of these things. And then we put it like that. And I'd say, now let's go back to who the people you called success were. This person's been divorced three times. This one is divorced. Their, their son or daughter died of a dug over it. You start going down, you start looking at it. You go, who, how, how are you going to define success? And how are you going to get there? And that's what I talk to my children about. Yes, they all have very good jobs. And I, but I said, guys, that's not, that, that's a part, part of success is having a job that pays well and gives, allows you to, to have a house or whatever it is to, to live. But that's not success. Six, you have to define. And so I, I, and it got quiet when I brought the kids because we were doing it in front of Yaya and Papu. And I said, define success for me. And that's the number one thing I would, I would focus kids on. Tell me what success is. And then tell me how you're going to get there. Yes, you want to be married. Okay, you want to be married. And I would say to them, do you care that your wife or your husband is a non-believer? No, no, I don't want that. How are you going to find that? Right? It doesn't magically, no one knocks at your door and says, hey, I'm, I'm perfect husband. You really got to go out and find that stuff. And, right. and it's different than when you and I, you got social media, you get it they're much easier now that you right. can. Right. But, Define success for me. Will you have what kind of friends will you have? Are you willing to be involved with drugs? Are you willing to to um, have a couple of marriages? Are, what do you What do you What kind of a friend will you be? What kind of a son in law or daughter in law will you be? Define that for me, and then I think that's what I focused my kids on. Define success for me, and I'll and I'll tell you it's going to be a good life. I, I love I love that you're saying that because you have such. Uh... A, a power of being able to influence so many lives with what you do, right? The, the amount of different media that you've got in there. Uh, you created an LMS multimedia, you said when your kids were young and you didn't know if you were gonna do any other films or whatever. Um, what, what, what can somebody find at LMS multimedia if they go there? Um, and and how, uh, what's, what are some of the resources there that they can use to kind of teach this lesson that you're talking about, about success? And, and I love that you're saying that success is not, uh, materialistic success is those things that people lose you know like i remember you know i i i used to listen to nirvana you know and i loved nirvana i was heartbroken when when kurt cobain took his life you know and he takes his life because there's no hope there right the lead singer of in excess you know michael uh, yeah. Hutchinson takes his life great music man and but these guys don't have hope in their lives they're they're absent right prince right you know houston michael jackson yeah all these things just add, I know and so we talk about it and and you think that that's success but it's not it's not and I love your definition of success how does how does LMS multimedia have things on there that they can go and, and find and I'm not saying this is for people to buy stuff from you to you know get you you know support you but to support them and their families and the, and the ministries that they have what are some things out there that you think would be helpful to them you know every product and I'll tell you, first of all going back to what you're talking about because you do get what happens is Praise becomes like a narcotic. You get so much of it, you keep craving more and more of it. And one thing I learned is, A, when you get that praise, pass it straight through. So do not take ownership of it. Pass it through to Christ where it belongs. Um, because let me, this is one thing people don't realize. I'll, and I'll get to your question in one second. What people don't realize, when I write, I write in absolute solitude. My office, there's nobody here. I write in absolute solitude. When I prepare for acting, absolute solitude. It's me reading over the script, thinking. When I'm dancing, a lot of the dance rehearsals, 90% of it, are me alone. 
They've shown me the choreography. I go alone. So much of the work I do is it's, it's alone. And what happens is you then go out into the world with the film and whoosh, you get this hit with this rush of hundreds of people coming up and saying, and if you're not careful, that goes to your head and you want more of that. For me, thank God I'm older now too, but it, it to me, it, it, it's, I never look at it like me, I look at it like us. And what do I mean by us? I look at it like that yaya and that papu, that mom, that dad, that aunt, that uncle, that no, no, no. We're trying to get through life. This is not easy stuff. It's trying to keep your kids off drugs, trying to keep them go oriented, trying to keep your marriage together. Not easy stuff. And so whatever I can share and we can share in the moment, I'm happy with it. I don't take that praise to, to heart. In terms of what Ellie and us multimedia, um, every product, whether it's falling in love with Sophia, whether it's uh, Faith, Hope, and Love, Do You Want to Dance, Christmas with the Prince, everything there is going to have Guide to the, the Divine Liturgy, Guide to Holy Week. It's going to have some religious element to it that is going to, hopefully, in a subtle way, um, the, the Saints video series, um, you know, those, every time I watch those, uh, by the way, I have a quick story to tell you in a second. Every time I watch one of those, um, it, it brings me back into the faith. You know, it makes you feel good about the faith. So, you know, I did the OCN tape. Do you remember? The, the OCF, the, the Orthodox yeah. Christian Fellowship. Right. Yeah. right. So do you remember the big question I asked you? And, and, and you remember your response? I think I've told you this once or twice. Uh, you're going to have to remind me because I, right. I already blew it. Question. I already have another question that I asked you. So <laughs> I asked you, I said, um, do you, uh, I said, we, I asked this of all the priests. I said, tell me what it's like to be a priest. Mm. And at first, they, it was a fluff, you know, but I said, them, yeah, come on, you got to make this, otherwise it's going to be a boring video. And so a lot of them started answering, real. it's this, it's that. And you and I were doing our interview and you said, hey, I got to cut it short. I have, I have to go meet somebody. So I'm like, all right, cool. So we cut it short. Do you remember what happened? Bob, I got to tell you that I remember shooting that video, and that was a that was a that was one year into my into my ministry as a priest. And I, I got to tell you, I don't know if I've ever told you this, or if I've ever said this to many people before. And who knows how many people are going to watch this? But I was thinking about leaving the priesthood during that time. Oh, this makes sense then. Yeah. So you came back from the meeting. Mm -hmm. and we continued the interview, and I remember I said, "Okay, let's start back in," and you paused and you said, "Remember the question you asked me?" I said, "Yeah." I said, "But." what's it like being a priest and you looked at me and you go remember that thing i just drove it was easily half hour half hour an hour of your life she didn't show up that's what it's like being a priest oh man that just hit me i just i just couldn't believe that you had taken up like they literally did not show up for it mm -hmm. it was so and i think why it hit me so hard that when i was when i was editing the very first saint tape it was saint george and I never forgot this. The editor was, he was a Catholic. And we were talking about saying in between breaks, hey, how did you get involved in this and that? And he goes, oh, I really wanted to do something for the church. And I said, oh, really? Because yeah, I've been away for a while. And I said, oh, what, what happened? He said, I had flesh eating disease and I was in the hospital and I was literally thought I was going to uh, die. And he said, and one day a priest came and he goes, I, I was, it was such a moment for me, like that somebody cared. He said, but I could barely move to get dressed and to move. And he said, it finally took me 15, 20 minutes to get out there. And he had left. And all, he, all that was left was his card. And he goes, that's when I left the church. Mm. So hearing you say that, I remember thinking to myself, better that she left than he left because it, you know what I mean? Yeah, I um, do. I do. I do. I do. And, and But uh, looking back, it doesn't surprise me that that's where that because i kind of remember that feeling yeah it was from you or from a lot of priests at the time <laughs> no it was it was it was a it was a rough time you know and then i, I have to tell you that i i the same prayer that you prayed at saint sophia's about the, the the film industry i i said that prayer at the cathedral in oakland is where i was the assistant and said if, if this is what you really want me to do here i am show me and and i would tell you the summer of 2002 changed my life. We, we had done uh, the OCF video earlier that uh, that year in early 2002. 
And then uh, in the summer of 2002 is when I said that prayer and God answered it. And here I am 20, what, 20 years later. So here we are, exactly 20 years later. How did God answer? You know, um, it, it's interesting you ask that. I'll make a really long story short. Um, my wife and I were in LA for the YAL conference. It was the National YAL conference in 2002, was in LA. And the clergy lady was right after it. And Father Tom, who's now of blessed memory, was my prostamino in Oakland, said, you need to come home right after the YAL conference. You come back to Oakland right after the YAL conference because you'll be the only priest in the Bay Area. Every other priest was going to be down in LA for that. And I was on call for all the churches in the Bay Area. Being Gary Kiriaku, I was a little bit defiant and I milked my time in Southern California because that's where my wife and I were from. And we took our time coming back up. And as I drove back up, it was around July you know, 2nd, July 3rd. And I told the secretaries at the church, I said, don't call me unless it's an emergency. I said, I really want to enjoy July 4th weekend. My anniversary is July 6th. I said, give us some time. It was our fifth wedding anniversary. We got married in 97, so five years in 2002. I said, give me, give me the weekend to enjoy, you know. So we drove all the way from LA to Oakland. As soon as I got to the house in Oakland, the pager went off and I called the church office and they said that a, a boy had drowned in uh, Pittsburgh. And I was like, where's Pittsburgh? I was like, how am I supposed to get to Pittsburgh? I was like, Pittsburgh. And they're like, there's a Pittsburgh, California. I don't even know if you knew that. Right, right. So I went out to, I, I didn't know this family. I didn't know the kid. And, and so I went out there. And as I got out there, make a really long story short, I didn't talk to the mother. I didn't talk to the father. I walked into the room and I didn't know what to do or what to say. And then I just sat there with the family and I, I made sure that I didn't say anything because I knew that whatever I would say would be stupid. And after it was all done and, and I, I went to the funeral for the little boy and, and all, of, all of that, um, the mom said, You're, you were invaluable to our getting through last week and what happened and I said I didn't do anything she said oh you did more than you know and that's when I just realized that God puts us in situations where we're supposed to be and I stopped asking why am I here like I was always saying to myself why am I here why am I here why am I here and I changed it to here I am and ever since I changed it to here I am um, it's put me in situations where God speaks to me and I know you know um, I was I got to here when I showed up to your set on that, that night with my daughter, I was really concerned about coming back and going, man, am I doing the right thing? Should I have stayed in the industry? Should I have done this or that? But it was no doubt that, that I'm doing what God has asked me to do, right? Like, like I'm doing what God puts in front of me to do. And, and I'm, here I am and I, and I serve. And um, it, was a rough, it was a rough year, that first year of being a priest, because you deal with identity, you know, you see other priests around you, you know, like, I got to be holy like him. And then it's like, I'm not, and I got to have a beard like him, or I'm not, or I got to wear the hat like him, and I'm not. And then when it was time to go visit Michael and, and his mom, Michelle, and dad, Peter, who are still part of, big part of my life and my ministry, I, I remember them in my prayers all the time. Um, when it was time to go drive out there and be there, um, I just, there was, God was speaking to me and said, don't say a word, just be there. And that's when I realized that God will, God provides with what he needs. Right. And, and so I didn't ever have to compromise or, or justify or, or, or any of that and just, and just do it and just be what God needs me to do at that time. And, and uh, you know, it's the same thing with this, the, the, the podcast that we're doing now, the Armed with faith. It's my hope that people watch this and get this or listen to this and realize that that everything that we do affects somebody's life, right? Like like everything that we do. I mean, from this podcast, from a sermon, keep your fork, from the the priest doing Bible study with the woman for just a half an hour, or from the priest leaving his card and leaving, and the guy being so hopeful to, to be with him, or a movie or a book, Bob. We touch people's lives in a way that we don't realize, and 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 if we we're careful with the moment and we're careful with what God gives us. And you mentioned the parable of the talents. Um, God's going to come asking for it. And what did you do? Right. What did you do? And it's heavy on me. yeah, it does. It does. And, and, and uh, you know, um, I, I'm, I'm happy. I love what I do. I have a beautiful wife who supports everything that I do. I wouldn't be able to do what I do if Christy wasn't as supportive. 
with what she does. My kids love what I do. Um, I live in a great area. I have great archbishop. I have a great metropolitan. I have great brother priests that support me. You know, great parishioners that that lift you know up and and are and share their resources to make sure that things happen. And and then I get to meet people like you that do amazing things with your talent as well. And and I love seeing it. And I love knowing it. And I love you know I love that I can say that when I was a kid. I remember the Miata. I remember you pulling into church. I remember you lighting your candle. I remember thinking, there's the guy from Back to the Future. There's the guy from Who's the Boss? You know, there's the guy from, you know, Silver Spoons. And he's at church, you know? And I remember as a, I don't know if you remember her. Her name was Eleni. I don't know her last name, but she was a Laker girl. Remember the Laker girl that used to come to church all the time? Lake Cletus. She's a friend. Yeah. And she, she would come. We were, we were altar boys thinking, there's a Laker girl that comes to church. She's a, she takes communion. You, these things have such an impact on people's lives that we don't realize how valuable they are and how our, our actions and our imitation and our, our, our journey affects the lives of so many other people, right? Um, mm -hmm. I tell a great story that in Oakland one summer, um, we were at the summer camp and I was building a, a, a race car. They did these slot car races. And this kid, in, instead of being down at the river, fishing or swimming or canoeing, doing whatever all the kids were doing, he was watching me build the race car. And I looked up at him and I said, I said, you know, Yanni, what are you doing? And he said, I want to watch you build your race car. And I said, why? And he said, I want to see what a priest says when he hits his thumb with a hammer. <laughs> right. And I was like, wow. I was like, that's, you know, be careful with what you say when you hit your thumb with the hammer. You, you're a priest. They're watching every move. He said, I want to know if you say any bad words. And I was like, that's interesting, you know. So I make it a point to ask, you know, my dentist, do you floss every night? And, and he gets embarrassed and goes, no. And I was like, okay. So I'm not a bad priest if I forget to pray one night or if I fall asleep without praying. Right, 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 so right. What I'm saying is that, is that when we intentionally live our faith, God is always good to us. And, and when we don't intentionally live our faith, God is still good to us because, yeah. because there's that love, right? And so... I'm really thrilled for you, Bob. I can't wait to see the marriage made in heaven. Um, I think it's, I think it might be one of your best because I saw you on the set. You had that zone. You were, <laughs> you, were zone. Um, you, you did, you, you were very, you were very hospitable with, with me and Elena, but um, it was neat watching you in your element and doing your thing. And um, I, I got to tell you how much I love the, the hour has flown by. We're over an hour, but um, thank you for your time. Thank you for what you do. One quick note to you. Yeah, thank you. I say this now. This is 2022, March of, of 2022. I something tells me that because we've always talked about you being involved with the film and so forth. Something tells me two things. I'm gonna, I'm gonna because this will memorialize it. One, I don't think that I don't think you there's something down the road that God has with that. I don't know what it is, but He doesn't has God hasn't turned a blind eye to that in your life. I think that's that's part of it. The second thing is, um, I think you're on the cusp of becoming that guy that younger priests go, oh, I want to be like him. I want to be like that. I want to I want to give a sermon like him. I want to be, and I think you're on the cusp of that. And I think that God's going to, and I actually I think I made a prediction on the set the day before you got there. Um, Paniota was videotaping me. And I said, I have a feeling I know where you're going to end up. I think I know how it's going to, it's going to be big and it's going to be a big responsibility. Um, but I think you're going to be ready for it. And I, when I was watching the other day, I thought, wow, has he grown from when I first met him to this? But I think that God's got something substantial for you. And I think you'll be ready for it when the time comes. And I think that all these things we've talked about are going to, play into that and i think uh it'll be a good move for everybody for the parishioners for you for everything and i think god will you i think you're going to do a great job so just invite me there when you get there <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna i'm gonna end the show i'm gonna I, I usually let you end the show but i'm gonna end the show right there but i'm gonna say one last thing i'm gonna yeah. take everything that you just said and i'm gonna give it back to him like you said yeah. everything you said and give it right back to him because it's to him be the glory right like to him <laughs> and and uh, I look around me and think that there's so many other more qualified, more talented uh, people to do it. But um, I appreciate that. I really do. But I take it and I give it right back to him because glory, glory be to God. 
Bob, God bless you. May God multiply your efforts and everything that you do. And um, when when uh, the movie is released, I maybe we can do this again and and um, and talk Love. about how people can see it and and do that as well. So God bless you. God By the way, be in August. Around August, we're going to have a premiere down in LA, LA Live. It's 850 seats. It's you, you got to come to it. You got. I'm going to call you with the date, and you can bring. Make sure it's it. make sure it's after the after the 15th of August because. Oh, good. Yeah, 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 yeah. So after yeah, Bonnie yeah. Diaz, I'm I'm good. Okay. And 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 you're right about you're right about Bonnie Yota. You hit it. And uh, her name, you, her name, Bonnie Yota. Good. It's all good. Yeah. And all holy good. How do you not? You know, how do you not want to be around that, right? Ana Yota, good, all holy good. Because they're still fine for on the side. Yeah, she was. She's great. So she'll be with us at Ionian Village this summer. So Bob, thank you. Hi, brother. Everything that I you said, take it, give it to God, and yeah, and man. you keep doing that, man. You're inspirational. I love you. you are as well, brother. You're a great friend. You, keep doing what you do. My love to your family and 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 the boys. And if you need Stay anything, in touch. Okay. Stay yeah. in touch, brother. Take care. Be well. All the best. Bye bye.